Hey everyone, uh, my name is Zach Malis. I'm a historical interpreter with Three Rivers Park District. Uh, thank you for joining me again for another Throwback Thursday to connect to history uh, in your home. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the fur trade history here in Minnesota. Uh, so I'm in my home right now, but virtually, of course, I'm on the uh, riverbanks of the uh, Minnesota River uh, near Shakopee, Minnesota. Now, the Minnesota River is a very old river, um, and it's super important for this area. It's so important that they actually named the whole state after this river. And this river, as many rivers in Minnesota, have been used as important transit and trade routes for centuries. American Indian folks like the Dakota and Ojibwe have been traveling on these rivers in, in canoes and have extensive trade routes all throughout not just Minnesota, but also the Great Lakes region and the Great Plains. And so they've been trading for centuries uh, using the waterways as sort of their trade routes. Um, and over time, as Euro-Americans started moving into the area, they also got involved in some of this trade, and, and especially what we call the fur trade. Um, especially after uh, the War of 1812, um, people start moving here, uh, Fort Snelling is founded, and um, all these uh, fur traders start moving into Minnesota to trade with the Dakota and Ojibwe folks in this area, especially the uh, Dakota. Now, really by 1832, there was one really dominant fur trade company here in this region of Minnesota, and that was the American Fur Company. And here's their pennant right here. See the AMFCO, American Fur Company. And it was headquartered here in Minnesota, uh, down at uh, Mendota or Bedote. Um, and it was uh, led in Minnesota by uh, Alexis Bailey and later on Henry Hastings Sibley. Now, while it was headquartered at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers at Bedote, uh, it relied on this extensive trade network and these trade routes all throughout Minnesota using the rivers as waterways. And the hub of those uh, trade routes were really these fur trade posts like this one here. This fur trade post was built in the 1840s by Oliver Faribault, uh, and it was located uh, near the uh, Dakota village of Tinto Atunwe, Chief Shakpe's village, at what is now modern-day Shakopee. Now, uh, the fur trade post would be well-stocked by fur traders with a lot of trade goods uh, from out east especially. So these are uh, trade goods are uh, Euro-American-made things that they're bringing out here to trade with Dakota people. So these would be things like metal pots and pans, uh, wool blankets, hats, uh, firearms and ammunition, other uh, things made out of iron or steel. Um, they would stock the store, the trade post with those things and they're trading with Dakota people and what they want in exchange are animal pelts, the furs from animals that are found here in Minnesota. Now, why do they want these animal pelts and furs? Well, because the animal pelts and furs can be processed and made into other things like hats, uh, muffs to keep your hands warm, coats, um, all kinds of things that were very fashionable clothes out east and in Europe. And so they're trading all these trade goods uh, to Dakota folks who are bringing in furs to trade and taking those furs and shipping them to be processed and to make all kinds of fashionable garments out east and in Europe. Many Minnesota animals were involved in the fur trade, but the most valuable fur of all was that of the beaver. The beaver is uh, America's largest rodent, and it's adapted very well to live in rivers and wetlands. Uh, they live near rivers, and they'll uh, gather up sticks and twigs and build a dam to dam up the river to make like a nice little uh, beaver pond. And they build a lodge also out of sticks and mud. It kind of sticks out of the water a little bit, but the entrance is actually underneath the water. Uh, so they live inside a lodge, they build dams in the river, and so they're very well adapted to live in water. They're semi-aquatic, which means they spend a lot of their time in the water. Um, and their bodies are kind of set up to do that. They have large kind of webbed feet, they have that big kind of paddle-shaped tail, um, they also have very distinctive front teeth that they use to gnaw uh, on wood and to, to cut down trees and to gather sticks. Um, and they have really thick, oily fur, which makes them water resistant when they're in the water, and it's very insulating as well. And it's those qualities, it's being water resistant and fairly insulating, that not only benefits beavers, but when the fur is used to make clothes for people, those same qualities make it really good for making coats and hats. And that's why the beaver fur was so in demand in the Minnesota fur trade. So here with me, I have a, a beaver pelt. This is actually from a beaver here. Um, and so you can see it's been tied up to this hoop so it's stretched uh, so that it dries. Um, and that's a way to uh, preserve and, and to package and to ship the beaver pelt. Um, and what you can't really see, it might be tough here, um, the, in the beaver fur, there's two kinds of hairs. There's these thicker, longer, sturdier hairs that we call guard hairs. And what you can't really see is 
down in here, there's this softer, fluffier under fur. And that's what's really valuable. And so with a beaver pelt, what they want is that soft under fur that they're going to separate out from the pelt and have kind of this soft fur that they can felt into hats. So it's shaping it different. So rather than, you may have seen like a fur coat before where it looks like it's a solid fur on a coat, the beaver fur, they're going to use, take that under fur out of there and felt it and shape it into a hat. And I'll see if I can show you some of that uh, soft under fur that's in there. So here, maybe you can see this a little bit better. So this is that beaver pelt. And over here are those really kind of thick, longer guard hairs that kind of protect the pelt a little bit more. But underneath, it's hard to see, there's this wispy fur. It's that under fur, and that's what makes really good hats. That's what the fur traders want. And maybe it's easier if I show you right on the side over here. Let's see, can you see? That's really kind of wispy, soft fur. So when you separate that under fur from the pelt, it kind of looks, um, if you've ever brushed your cat or brushed your dog and you kind of have that pile of, of fur that's left over, it's kind of like that. And if you poke it enough with like, let's say like a needle, um, you kind of start to harden it up and it forms and you can actually form it into a whole hat. And that's how they made beaver hats uh, that were super popular in Europe. Because beaver pelts were in such high demand, over time they became over harvested and they were actually pretty hard to find in Minnesota. Uh, but there were plenty of other furs to go around in Minnesota, all kinds of animals that were used in the fur trade. Uh, here, especially in this region, uh, another animal that's similar to a beaver uh, is the muskrat. They're often uh, confused with each other when seen out in the wild. If you've ever seen a, a muskrat swimming across the pond, um, sometimes they kind of look like a beaver and they get... Uh, uh, misidentified, but uh, beavers are also an aquatic animal. They also spend a lot of their time in the water, most of their time in the water, um, and they build similar dens uh, like a beaver does. Um, out in the water, you'll see the kind of uh, pile of sticks and reeds and mud kind of coming up out of the water. That might be a little beaver den or a little muskrat den. Um, and sometimes they'll even move into uh, beaver lodges that are left over. Um, so these were um, really uh, uh, numerous here in this area of Minnesota and we're a huge part of the fur trade here in this region of Minnesota. There's all kinds of other animals too. For example, um, river otters that live in the rivers like the Minnesota and the Mississippi. Uh, river otters were also very in demand for their fur. Um, Weasels and minks uh, make really good coats. So rather than the beaver where you're going to take that under fur uh, from underneath and felt it into something, uh, minks and weasels, um, you want to use like the whole fur for whether it's a coat or maybe like a muff to keep your hands warm, something like that. So these are really in demand too. Um, also animals like uh, this one here is a marten. Uh, so pine martens uh, are really in demand as well. Um, as well as things like foxes and raccoons. Um, there's all kinds of different animals here that were used in the fur trade. Um, they're this natural resource that people were using to make fashionable clothes out east. Uh, but over time, fashions changed and the, the beaver hat wasn't as fashionable anymore. They, they were making them out of silk and they were making all kinds of other clothes out of other materials that didn't rely on furs. Uh, so the fur trade eventually sort of declined. Uh, by the 18 fur by the 1840s, when this fur trade post is built, uh, the fur trade is really in decline in Minnesota. And, it, and it's around for a long time after that. I mean, there are still people um, that are harvesting furs and, and making fur coats and things like that. It's still uh, an industry in Minnesota, but not nearly as big of an industry as it was uh, back in the early 19th century, uh, during the time that we really cover at the landing and we interpret here at the uh, Oliver Faribault fur post at the landing. I think that's it for today. Thank you for joining me for another Throwback Thursday to connect to history at home. I hope you had a good time learning a little bit about the, the history of Minnesota fur trade and some of the animals that were used in the fur trade. Uh, thanks, I'll see you next time.